Welcome back to the Marching Health Audio Experience. I'm Dr. Elliot Cleveland, your host, physical therapist and founder of Marching Health. I have a great friend and amazing educator on today with me. His name is Clark Cothran. Clark works with Wando High School and he still works on the visual staff with the Blue Devils. He's a young guy, he's doing some visual design. He does a lot of freelance work and he's got some great advice for people trying to pursue that path. And then we also wanna learn some lessons that he's learned along the way over these past couple of years of getting into the activity as a young person, young professional. So Clark, thank you for coming on. Um, give us a little bit of a rundown as to what you're up to now. Yeah, Elliot, thanks for having me on the podcast, man. Uh, so, man, what am I up to? Uh, right now, it's uh, springtime of 2020. We're all kind of cooped up in our own households in the quarantine. But uh, right now, uh, we are uh, kind of looking into the future with uh, what the fall is, is looking like with design. And uh, I'm trying to get things into place with clinics, instruction, as well as drill and show design, all that. So, yeah, it's kind yeah. of kind of a lot going on, but for the activity that we're involved in, you know, it's, it's a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you and I met a few years back when we were teaching at Wando together and Clark is the most committed staff member I have ever met in my life. He was going to school at the university of South Carolina, which is, he's going to hate me telling this story. It's two <laughs> hours away, maybe two and a half hours away from where Wando is. Yeah. And he said, as a student, you were, what, a music performance major? Music education. Music ed major. Okay. So yeah. as a student, he said, look, I'm in South Carolina. I want to go to the best school in the state and learn how they're so good and learn what makes them so great. Clark drove that far every single day for an entire season to come to our rehearsals and be on the field and give his visual education to our students for free. Like that's, that's unheard of who drives amidst your entire schedule as a music ed major drive that far there and back in the same day, just to learn and soak up like a sponge as much information as you could from the Wando staff. So um, Clark, first off that tells a lot of people, about you, but also tells young people who are listening to this, how they got to hustle to get what they want. There's, I mean, you were one person in your class, your entire graduating class, who was willing to work that hard to get where you want to be. What did you learn during that year? Yeah. So you kind of gave a pretty good uh, context to the entire situation. So as I was real quick going backwards before we go forwards, when I was in college, so we're in college for like four years, in that music education track, the, the track is to really be a band director or a choir director or orchestra director or something like that, to pretty much be within a school system to teach publicly, to get a teacher salary and do that kind of thing. And so throughout, throughout college, I was like, okay, so I'm going to be this teacher, I'm going to be this band director. And then getting towards the end of college, I'm like, man, I don't know if like, this is the thing that I want to do. Cause I'm like, have these other opportunities I, I kind of want to pursue. Um, I really enjoy drum corps, but also just providing education and value to marching band and just to young students. Right. So I knew that going into my senior year of college, I wanted to work with the Wando band. To be honest, like I was going to work with two bands and then the other band really didn't like that I was working with Wando. So I just committed to Wando full time. And also this goes back way before my senior year of college, because ever since I was in eighth grade, I was competing against Wando at the 5A state championships and we were getting our butt handed to us and they were winning every single year. And at this point, going into 2016, they hadn't lost the state championship since 2004. So anyway, like I, I knew who Wando was, like I wanted to be a part of Wando, but also coming out of my age out year, like I also had something that I could provide to Wando as well. So there was also an, another, um, the, the visual staff at, at Wando was pretty much all blue devils. It was like a guy named Tim, um, a guy named Daniel, and then another guy named John, who was a, um, who was a student at Wando. So like those three guys are pretty much the vis staff. So like, okay, I'm like, Hey, can I, can I join in? So they're like, yeah. 
long story short, I was super happy to drive um, every single day of the week down there. And it was something that I looked forward to because it was something that it, it was fun. Like it's fun for me to teach, but it was, it was fun to be a part of something that good. Same thing with like, with the Blue Devils. It's just, it's a blessing to be a part of the team as well as learning, learning from the people that you're working with. And so with the thing with Wando, it's like, you know, you start, you start at the bottom, right? And, and you hustle and you, you say, you ask the director, hey, can I work for you? The worst you can get is no. Like just send the email, send, uh, send the phone call, right? So the worst that can happen is no. So join staff and I'm here five years later and uh, I feel, I really feel a part of that staff and I love pouring into those kids and I've learned a lot, especially as a teacher. Uh, Cause you, you make a bunch of mistakes and, and something that I would tell any college student, whether you're going to be a band director or not, whether you're going to be a, a marching person or color guard instructor or freelancer is you're going to make mistakes. The thing is that you, ha you just have to go out there and get in the trenches, spend time in the trenches, do the work, make mistakes you're going to say stupid stuff. You're going to say, you're going to, you're going to stumble over your words. I still do all the time. Right. But it, that's the thing that doesn't really matter because you're going to move on from it and you're going to become better, a better teacher, better educator, better designer from it. Mm -hmm. How has your experience there shaped what you have learned as a young designer? Cause it is not easy to get into and the composition, <clears throat> excuse me, the composition or the arranging side of things, or especially the writing um, of drill and actual visual design and choreography. Um, how have you taken and synthesized what you've learned to improve your skills in that area? So being being there is an is one aspect to where I of my environment basically. And your environment is basically yourself within your surroundings, what you take in through your eyes, through your ears, um, through your touch, pretty much all your senses. And that's your environment. So if my environment is being a part of um, one of the best band programs in the Southeast, then you don't really have a choice, but to soak up that kind of excellence. Same thing with a drum corps, or maybe you're, a part of a really good indoor percussion. Like if you're within that environment that's, that has that high level of success or excellence, we'll say, you don't have a choice but to soak it in. And th the thing that is even more of a catalyst for, for growth is if you choose to want to look and see how you can learn from these, the source of information, this great wealth of knowledge. And so, specifically at Wanda. So I'm like, I'm here with some really great teachers, some of the best uh, band directors in the country, some really amazing uh, technicians, as well as some really great caption heads. So one, I was just thankful to be there, but I, I studied the drill as well. I offered unique, um, unique services to them that I could um, help provide because at the end of the day, too, it's like I have a unique perspective and a unique set of skills that I can provide to this client, to this group. And I also am invested. So it's like it's this like two way relationship. It's this win win situation. And so Wando being only like one one program that I'm a part of. And so you start to see patterns across other programs. And um, yeah, so long story short, like you don't really have a choice but to soak in what your surroundings are. So basically if you're surrounded by excellence, like you don't have a choice, but to be excellent. Right. So shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about you as a blue devil, you were a member and then now you're on the staff. What perspectives have changed for you making that jump? And maybe it's an educational thing that you've learned about how to teach something differently as a staff member versus a student, or maybe it's a, a leadership thing or just a structural concept that you picked up what perspective has changed um, as a staff member versus when you were a member I have to think about this one being being at the Blue Devils is something that you you should never take for granted 
Um, and it's a true blessing to be um, a member at the Blue Devils as well as being on staff. So I think if you acknowledge the fact that that is a blessing and that's a gift and that not many people get to be a part of something like that, it, it reframes your perspective. So like, for example, if, like, if I'm a member and if I've been looking at the Blue Devils as the standard, and again, I'm saying this from like an unbiased perspective so that um, as like more of like an objective perspective, not as me as a member or me as a, a staff member, but like if, if anything in life, you're, you look at something as the standard and then you come into that and you you now have that opportunity to be a part of it. It, it, it reframes your perspective of like thankfulness. And so therefore as a member, like I was still trying to learn anything that I could rather than going along for the ride. Because I also knew as a member, it was a possibility to continue on to teach within the drum course setting. So I was using my time as a member as a, as a learning experience for later when I was to get out of being a member. So, you know, on the staff side of things, you can, it's just like a, it's the next step in, in learning. And same thing with being surrounded by some really great members and some really great performers. I'm now surrounded by some really great teachers and some really great designers while getting to have the opportunity to teach some of the best performers in the world, you know, so it's, and feed off of the energy of them, feed off of the energy of the staff. And it's just a, it's just a good environment. Yeah. Awesome. Now, as a young professional in this activity, what uh, lessons, let's say, let's call them mistakes. Let's be bold in our language. What mistakes have you made over the past couple of years since graduating that you've learned from that you would um, caution someone else and, or be able to give them a tip to avoid? Mistakes, man. Um, Are you old enough to have made a mistake in this yet? I'm kidding. Nah, I don't want your podcast to run like five hours long, dude. So I gotta, <laughs> I gotta give you the, the dummies version. So, Let's start with, uh, let's start with just instruction, right? So, you know, the first time you start to teach in front of people, like it's going to be a very weird experience. You're going to have, uh, you're going to have anxieties. You're going to have, uh, you're going to stumble over your words. You're oftentimes not going to give, um, not going to give very good information. Sometimes you're going to receive some resistance from the students, but the thing the best thing that you can do is just like be comfortable with yourself, strive to be comfortable with yourself. Um, and I think that's going to help you be relaxed as you teach as well as give good information and, and, and speak from a very like conceptual place rather than trying to worry about like what words are the right words to place in a certain order. And how did you sound like doing it makes such a difference. Just go out there and get in, get in the field and, and teach. Same thing with design. Like now we'll kind of transition into, into design. So there's a lot of really good designers who aren't good business people. And there's a lot of good business people that aren't good designers. And so I think it's important for anybody who is self-employed to kind of understand this and strive to strive to be a good enough business person and a, uh, to hone their craft in design. And I mentioned this before, but not take anything for granted because your efforts are not, do not go in vain and everything compounds on itself. I can, I can look back on my income. I can look back on my, the number of clients that I've had. I can look back on the quality of clients that I've had. And just simple opportunities, how one little thing grows into the next. So like, for example, like I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but specifically with design, how I've grown in, in that, like, I remember the first drill that I was going to ever have was going to be the summer of 2016 during my age out year. And so like, I was you know trying to get everything in, in, in line that I possibly could because that I knew of because there's no degree for this. You can't just like go to school for this, which is, we can talk about that in a minute here. <laughs> like how to learn and, and, and 
develop your craft, but kind of going back into just doing it, throw yourself in the waters and then you'll kind of figure it out. Like jump out of the plane, make the parachute on the way down. And one thing that I would tell anybody is like, if it's your first year and you're trying to get a client, go for a client that one you can provide value to that's not too big of a client. So like, for example, I'm gonna give you like some simple tactical information here. Go for like a 1A or 2A school and then get like one client, maybe two. My first year I got three clients and it was probably too much and they were small schools. But when you're trying to figure out how to do something while you're doing it, it's not a fun experience. Anybody who started with like finale, trying to like make music in finale, while trying to make music, like it's not a fun experience. Same thing with drill writing for Pyware. Like trying to learn the program while you're trying to write drill is not a fun experience. If you're a jazz musician, trying to figure out how to play jazz while trying to figure out how to play the trumpet, like it's not a fun experience. So like go back to what can I handle and be realistic. I remember my first year I was like trying to get this like 4A, 5A school and somebody who I looked up to was like, Hey, don't do that because even if it's a possibility, you can really screw up on this. And the thing is like your reputation, especially in this activity is one of your greatest assets. And so like, if you do a really good quality job with a 1A, 2A school, then you can build on top of that the next year, then the next year, then the next year. And I'm somebody who struggles with patience. Like I want it now. Like I, I want to like learn. I want to like have this, uh, I want to have the answer now, but I have to like check myself and understand like things, things come in little small increments and be patient. And if I track everything and if I look at things over a long period of time, I can see that the first year I had three clients and the next year I had four clients. Then the next year I had six clients and then, the next year I had 10 clients. And so it's like, don't bite off more than you can handle, but bite off more than you can handle. It's, it's a weird, like, it's a weird way to learn. But again, like you, you, you can't, you don't learn unless you, you make mistakes. Right. Uh, and, and how are you going to learn if, if there's no way to, to learn? You know, that thought is very um, well put with everything else you've said that oh my the whole theme of this podcast is delayed gratification. It's not, oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, right. Being grateful for an opportunity and jumping in, offering your services for free to a school that you wanted to learn from, which is a great mm-hmm. move for a lot of people. Then uh, from there, talking about being grateful when you're in an organization that you're learning in, such as learning at Wando, then learning as a member at Blue Devils, then being grateful for an opportunity at the other cores that you've provided um, your value to whether it's a staff or a a different role Uh, and then as a young professional applying that exact same delayed gratification to your career so i think that's a a great and one of the reasons that i wanted to bring you on is because you did a takeover on our instagram page last week and excuse me the best information that week the thing that all the young people were paying attention to was actually your leadership advice so um, that I mean, I got messages for days after that of, "Hey, can you huh. put somewhere else again? Can you put it in a highlight reel so that we?" Can- I have all the videos if you need it too. So. Oh, I do have those videos. We got to get that after the talk. So okay. I want you to tell them. There was one point where you pulled out like an easel or a whiteboard and you wrote some stuff down. I want you to talk a little bit about that whiteboard and what you wrote down from a leadership perspective and how you um, bleed in these concepts of teaching, but also leadership and why that leadership is so important. So, man, this is something that I am, this is something that I'm, it's misunderstood uh, not only by directors and uh, teachers, but just as students. And so, like, what is the point of, pulling it up right here. Um, what is the point of like the leadership? So like the, the leadership and this is complex. Long story short with being a leader, like 
be a good person. And so like, if you're a good person, that's going to then affect everybody else. And if people are affected, then people are going to be driven towards one single goal. So like as a leader, one of the biggest pitfalls in my young leader, especially as a high schooler, um, is that you, you're not aware of your own pride and your own intentions behind making certain decisions. And I'm not saying high school kids are emotional as a disrespect, but almost like if we understand that high school kids and even people, everybody is just, we're emotionally driven people. And if we can understand how to separate our emotions from the job, we're 95% of the way there. And a lot of these, after reflecting on it, the first one, the first point was lead without words. The second one was communicate with directors. The third is staying humble and staying stoic. A lot of these like have direct ties to just keeping your emotions in check. Like what is the job that needs to get done and then just do it. Right. And it like, it, it's not flashy and being in a leadership position is not flashy. Like, and that's what it's so misunderstood. Like being a section leader, like I, I wish that certain directors would like, sh like tell students, Hey, you don't want to be in a leadership position. Yeah. It's an honor, but it's not going to be fun. Is it going to be worth it? Yeah. And is it needed and it's valuable? Absolutely. But like, is it, is it going to be fun? It shouldn't necessarily be fun. It's not, it's not to stroke my own ego. Hey, I'm the brass captain. Hey, I'm the drum major. It should, it's like you have a sense of responsibility and like you, you want to, be what's that phrase from spider-man with great response with, with great uh shoot what is it um with great talents comes great responsibility or something like that something like that um something like that and but you understand what i'm saying like be wise with with the responsibility that you have with great you have responsibility. power comes great responsibility it just hit me that's it great power that's it. great responsibility spider-man that's it so yeah, so right on that board, by the way, do you remember what now? Do you remember do I, right on the board? Yeah, I do. It's right here. So it would take a minute to, uh, to write it all out, but it's basically right there. Read that to us. Um, so the first one is lead without words. And so this is even going down the rabbit hole further of leading by example, this is like a specific tactic in which you can use. Like I'm my, my teaching and just my life is basically split up into the theoretical side of things and the tactical side of things, like the theoretical, the, the conceptual side of everything. And then there's the how to like, give me the steps in which I need to follow to do the things that I need to do to get done. Right. And so like, yeah, lead by example. That's very like conceptual. Like, how do you, how do you do that? Well, okay. Don't say anything. If you do the right thing and you do what needs to get done and you don't say anything like people will notice. And again, I've, I, I mentioned the story on your, your, um, story, but I, I was rushing through that story because like when you, when you're filming your story and you're like, man, I only have 15 seconds to say this thing. Like you rush, right? But luckily in this podcast, we have a little bit more time here. And I'm going to tell you a story. And the only, t the only reason why I tell you the story, and I'm trying to preface this a lot because I don't want to get uh, misunderstood. But anytime I tell a story about my leadership experiences or my time with a certain group, I only tell it from a perspective of uh, insight and trying to give insight, not from a place of uh, being conceited. So my first year at the Blue Devils, there was a few specific moments that kind of like, I think, define certain things later on. So like, for example, in 2015, my first year, uh, we didn't do, we had a pretty big penalty on quarterfinals night. We had a, um, we, we got second place on semifinals night and we ended up winning the world championship on finals night. But on finals day, I remember something very specific where 
we were in this rehearsal facility and so we, it was water break and then I went to go out to get my water and then I came back and like I was the first one out on the field and like I was oftentimes like one of the first ones out on the field but it was never like I was running out there like I had been taught to do previously but John Mahan was like hey Clark keep doing what you're doing and like I was like what do you mean and he's like just keep doing what you're doing and so I, I basically, I was like doing the right thing that I thought that I had to do, right? But I wasn't saying anything. I wasn't a leader by any means, but in a way I was because like I wasn't telling people, hey, you should come back on the field. Or I wasn't saying, hey, what are you guys doing over there taking a water break? Because at the Blue Devils, like water breaks are encouraged. But this has nothing to do with the Blue Devils. The Blue Devils, this is more of like a, like a, a, way that I was like just being and so I, I wasn't really saying much and so this followed up by the effect of John Meehan the next year pulling me out of an ensemble rehearsal at a camp and said hey so you're a horn sergeant and so I was like what this is are, are, did you just misspeak like I'm only a second year vet. I'm only marched for a year. Like, what do you, what do you, I'm speechless. And he's like, is that okay? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say? No. And so anyway, I was pretty like speechless for that night. And I, I could like barely sleep. So then the next day it was announced that like I was, the horn sergeant. And there were other people who were like four or five, six year vets within the horn line. Um, but certain people had, the collective was like, no, like he, he's, he's in that role for a reason. And also now that I have this responsibility of this role, right. Um, what's the best way that I can lead? Because a lot of times when we have these leadership positions, whether it's in band or whether it's in business or whether, whether it's in, our workplace or within our family, we, mis we misunderstand the effect of like the value of and the impact of just like doing the right thing and leading by example and not saying anything. Like doing an action and not saying anything about it. Right. And there's so much application to life with that principle is just like act and don't say any words. And if you have four leaders, like within a band, maybe like within a drum corps, you have um, trumpet, mellow, baritone, tuba, just within a brass line, or maybe it's like a, a band, um, a, like a high school marching band, you have the high brass, low brass, high woodwind, low woodwind, uh, color guard percussion. If you just have like those six leaders, and if those six leaders, you could add a drum major in there too, just doing the right thing and doing the things that need to get done without saying anything, people will follow like you don't have to use words and i think that's it's almost like it's almost fun to be a teacher and teach without saying any words and it's so impactful i remember sometimes like um uh, an instructor would come up to me and would just like you know fix my posture or just give some sort of like signal to instruct me in something that i need to do that i was doing wrong and that was so impactful because they didn't use words and so imagine like how impactful if, if I'm like, it's a, it's a simple member and my leader, my section leader barely ever talks. If he puts his horn up a set, like you better believe like, oh man, he's putting his, I, I better, I, I better put my horn up. That, that kind of thing. So like we miss, we miss, um, we don't understand like the value of wordless leading. Um, anyway, that's kind of long winded, but I'm, I've seen a lot of uh, effect, a lot of value in that, especially with current leaders in certain groups that I teach. Absolutely. Give us, give us the quick rundown of the rest of them. <laughs> yeah. So that's a little long way to hear. No, those the second one is communicate with, uh, <laughs> the second one is communicate with directors. So if you understand that you're in that, that role for a position, remember that you're the medium between the students and the staff. The staff wants to know what's happening with the students. The students want to know what's happening with the staff and you're that medium. 
use that and understand that as like a responsibility and how can you make the students under you uh, lives easier and how can you make the director's lives easier and also if you communicate with them they're going to give you guidance if you're running into an issue ask your director hey I'm, I'm running into a problem with this one student like do you have any advice hey I have to do this one thing do you have advice you know there's so many different um, so many uses to just communicating with the director Anyway, the fourth one is stay stoic. You're gonna run into a lot of issues. You're gonna run into a lot of obstacles. I found this very fruitful within my life. Stoicism is not the, is not the absence of emotion. It's analyzing emotion and acting accordingly. It's being aware, oh, I am mad, or hey, I'm, I'm really upset. I'm really happy. I'm really this, I'm really that. But as a leader, like, don't be emotional, like be a rock. People need you to be a rock in the good times and in the bad times. People need you to be consistent, doing the right thing consistently. So like being stoic is so important so that you, people can continue to rely on you. So the directors continue to rely on you and, and they know that you're not going to get emotional and that you can also guide the people under you to um, doing the right thing often. I love yeah, that I stoicism you. was in there because that's a, I mean, that's a big thing in the coaching world. You look at oh my gosh. the top coaches in basketball and in football in the past you know, two decades. Phil Jackson from the NBA is called the Zen master for a reason because he always mm -hmm. understands the proper mindset in the proper situation. Bill Belichick mm -hmm. and Nick Saban, Bill Belichick from the New England Patriots and Nick Saban from Alabama football are known for their excellence on the field and being the two football dynasties. And they're both the most stoic individuals until Nick Saban throws his headset when Clemson's beating them, go Tigers. But um, they're known for their stoicism during practices and during games. So that's a very oh, yeah. cool skill set for young people to understand what it is and then start to learn from it. Mm -hmm. I like that you mentioned coaches. I'm not going to get into this more or too much right now, but John Wooden, I just came across this the other day from a good friend of mine. John Wooden is, one of the, is considered the greatest basketball coach of all time. He was the basketball coach for UCLA in like the early 60s, like the 70s maybe. I don't have the, the years right, but he won like all these straight championships for like a decade or over a decade and like with like one loss. Anyway, he created this pyramid of success. And success, his, his definition of success is like, success is the peace of mind um, of knowing, oh man, I'm, I'm, basically the peace of mind of knowing that you did the best that you possibly could. And you'll have to look up the, the exact quote, um, but basically stoicism and like emotional self-control is like one of those building blocks within the overall pyramid of um, success or competitive greatness being at the very top. Anyway, um, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, but uh, the fourth point after stoicism is respect is a mirror. And so if you're a young, not just a leader, but a, a young leader, if you're giving respect, you'll get respect. And if you're getting respect, you're probably giving respect, maybe unknowingly. But also if you're, if you're wondering why I'm getting all this disrespect, it's probably because you're, you're not giving out respect. Yeah, and, I love that. And that's a simplified version using imagery that yep. any young person can understand because they have used mirrors since they can remember. So oh I gosh. love that point. Well, yep. um, thank you so much for dropping the leadership tips on top of all the musical and visual knowledge with all that. I consider you a good friend and I'm really Glad to have you on, and we, I, I know you will be back on here uh, before too long. So it's always a pleasure, Clark. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elliot.